Hello everyone, um, welcome to our webinar today. So my name is Talia, um, I'm a Client Relationship Associate at Mahana Corn Partners Group. Um, thank you for joining us. We'll be covering a broad range of topics today um, regarding Southeast Asia's two largest economies, um, Indonesia and Thailand. So first you'll be given an overview of the Indonesian market um, and a briefing on the recently enacted omnibus law. And then you'll hear about FDI incentives in Thailand and a summary of some future regulations that are poised to ease doing business in Thailand. So now I'll introduce our speakers today. Um, speakers, if you don't mind turning on your cameras. All right, let me change the slide. So we'll be hearing from Miguel Latour, who is Managing Director at Vistra. Miguel began his professional career in Indonesia in 2006 as a foreign trade advisor at the Embassy of Spain. And since then, he has worked in a range of consulting and business development roles throughout Asia and Europe. We we'll also hear from Flores Vanderbilt. Um, he was the Associate Director of Business Development at Vistra. He started his career at DLA Piper and has since gained over 14 years of experience in various legal and corporate positions before joining Vistra's Indonesia office. Finally, we have Luca Bernardinetti, um, who is the chairman and managing partner at Mahana Corn Partners Group. Luca leads the banking and finance division at MPG, and he is also the president of the European Association for Business and Commerce in Thailand. So now I will turn this over to Vistra to begin their presentation on Indonesia and the omnibus law. Thank you very much, Alia, for the introduction. Uh, well, let me speak, let me start first with Vistra, uh, with a very brief introduction about, about Vistra. Vistra is some of the top three corporate service providers globally. We come with 4,700 professionals as colleagues. And in our, from our physical presence in 46 countries, we manage around 200,000 legal entities. And well, our clients entrust us to administer assets value at more than 370 billion uh, US dollars. So reference 30% of the top 50 Fortune Global 500 companies and 60% of the top 10 private equity firms are among our clients. In Indonesia, we are mainly focused on, uh, on, on corporate services, uh, especially international expansion, providing services uh, ranging from uh, corporate, uh, corporate incorporation, accounting tax, payroll, working permits, licenses, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, maybe next one, please. Well, my presentation is going to be very brief. Uh, basically, I'm going to speak a little bit about Indonesia at a glance. Uh, well, I, I came to Indonesia 15 years ago, and I, I, I can say that, well, this is a very different country that, that I found back then. And nowadays, the country is a host of 270 million people. It's the fourth largest population globally, with a very young population, with 50% of the population under 40. The growing middle class uh, with around 100 million people, which is actually one of the key elements of the growth of the country in recent years and the focus on the upcoming years. Also, Indonesia is a member of the, of the G20. Uh, the GDP growth between 2000 and 2019 was uh, quite stable, around 5.2%. Uh, we'll speak later about 2020 and 2021. And um, well, another key element is the improving doing business ranking. Uh, again, around 14, 15 years ago, Indonesia was around 120 or 111, if I'm not mistaken, and now it's uh, 73, again, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, next one, please. Again, going back to doing business ranking in Indonesia, well, here we, we have break it down in, I, I'm not going to speak in detail about this, but basically the point of this is that Indonesia is doing a lot better than a few years ago. Um, again, 73rd, it may not look like an amazing number, but we have to see where we come from. Indonesia, as I said a moment ago, is being improving the ranking. It's ranking the last few years from 120 plus to 73. And now with the implementation of the omnibus law, we are expecting to even to improve this, this ranking quite a lot. 
I heard from some sources that hopefully we are going to be within the top 50 by next year. Let's see if this is happening. Anyway, as a couple of comments, for example, for, incorporate, for incorporating a company, again, 14, 15 years ago, it took for a PTPMA, which is a foreign owned company, took around five to six months. Nowadays, in four to five weeks, it can be implemented. Working, working permit, KITAS, was quite a challenge, was actually a nightmare. Again, even only five, 10 years ago. Nowadays, I must say it's quite a, a very simple, uh, very simple service and very simple um, staff to obtain. Could you just need to work with the right, with the right uh, contact, okay? Maybe next one, please. Again, here, I always like this, this slide or this graphic because it shows the resilience of Indonesia to, to some, um, especially to the financial crisis we have in 2009, 2010. And you see, uh, well, of course, the Indonesian economy declined back then. But if you see the, well, the, the economy was actually in recession back then. So the Indonesian economy relied back then a lot on the, on the commodity, which actually saved the country quite a lot. And if you see the graphic, it's been quite stable. Of course, now until 2020, that well, due to COVID, uh, Indonesian economy, uh, well, as you see here, it, it, I mean, it was only minus 2.1%. We also put here some references of some sources like JP Morgan, UE, Fitch, and IMF, which they, they forecast actually between minus 3.5 to even to positive three. Uh, but finally, Indonesia was minus 2.1%. And now the forecast, uh, GDP forecast for 2021, well, it depends on the source. We are seeing between 4.3 to 4.8 percent, and actually from other sources, I've seen even 6 percent. And my feeling for what I see so far now in, in March 2021 is that the Indonesian economy is doing fine. The omnibus law is, uh, for what I can see, again, is, is actually helping quite a lot, basically to bring foreign investment to the country. So I'm quite optimistic uh, with the with the 2021. Okay, maybe next one, please. Here, yeah, actually, this slide is um, it basically is showing comparison with some other countries, uh, China, Vietnam, Taiwan, etc. As you see here, it's not really accurate, the numbers. It actually was a forecast uh, at the end of last year. But Indonesia, um, as you saw, was, uh, we had a negative uh, growth last year, but we are going to have a big, um, a big bounce back this year. We also can see Thailand there, which I understand is not accurate the number. I think it was minus 6% or so. But also um, the bounce back of Thailand is expected also to be quite significant. But anyway, maybe Luca can speak in more detail later on about this one. And I think maybe next one. And this one basically is the government priorities for last uh, for the second term of President Jokowi. Um, and this one is going to be my last slide. Very straightforward from my side. Uh, basically, there are five priorities for President Jokowi. First one is development of human resources. This is critical for the development of the country. The second one is the economic transformation. Number three, infrastructure development. And with this one is, don't forget that Indonesia is an archipelago with more than 17,000 islands. Very complicated, some of the islands to get access to. Uh, and these are focus actually from the government that is being implemented quite, I would say, efficiently so far. And then the four and five regulation and bureaucracy simplification is part of the omnibus bill. I remember I was in a, in a, in a seminar like three, four years ago from BKPM, which is the investment coordinating board from Indonesia. I remember it was like, they were mentioning about 40,000 regulations that we had in Indonesia back then. Of course, it was a disaster. Many of them, they were overlapping each other. Uh, one of the main problems in Indonesia was that there is a lot of, even still now, a lot of gray area with the regulations, you're going to be black or white. There is a, a lot of gray area where you have to, to know whether it is what, okay? But nowadays with these new regulations, we understand we're having more and more color and it's way more, com way easier than, than it was uh, back then. And again, from my perspective as a professional, I've been in Indonesia 15 years now. Again, I've been, I see a big change in, the, in, in this stuff, which definitely is going to attract more and more investment. It's going to make things easier for, for investors, uh, and well, which is actually uh, really good news. The 2045 vision is, again, basically to transform Indonesia into an advanced nation. Um, strengthen and increase the middle class, as I mentioned earlier, currently 100 million people. Increase the GDP per capita from the 3,900 to 23,200 US dollars per habitant. And more regional cohesion, welfare state and sustainability. 
So that's actually my part. I've been a bit fast, but anyway, I think the, the best part is, is actually going to be uh, presented by my colleague Floris, uh, Floris van der Velde about the omnibus law with all the implications, the opportunities, business and so on. So Floris, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miguel. It's a perfect uh, bridge to the, to the next uh, topic indeed, uh, which is the omnibus law. Um, so, first a little bit on the agenda of, of the, the, the topics I discussed in the omnibus law. Uh, the positive investment list, very important uh, part. Simplification of business licensing, uh, ease of foreign ownership restrictions, minimum capital requirements and uh, manpower labor law. Um, so, first let me give, give you a little bit general introduction on, uh, on the law. Um, the Omnibus Law is, is part of the 2045 vision and the priorities set by President Jokri and his government, as, as just mentioned uh, by Miguel earlier. Uh, the government just realized that in order to make Indonesia's economy more uh, flexible, more mature and, and more modern, it needed to drastically do something. Uh, about the bureaucratic, regulatory, uh, and red tape environment, uh, you know, which, which, which has been hampering uh, growth and, and uh, sometimes really deterring foreign investors already for, for, for some decades even. So to achieve this, uh, the government uh, submitted a draft law on, on job creation, as it's formally called, but more popular known as the omnibus law. Um, just to give you a sense of the comprehensiveness of this law, Many, many see this as the biggest reform in Indonesia since the introduction of the civil code in 1847. Well, that's uh, something uh, I would say. And to give you a, a further sense of, of why that is the case, the law uh, has almost 1200 pages and it has revised almost 80 laws in one go, uh, including key laws for investment and business, which is uh, important for, for, for this topic and webinar. Uh, there are st some topics and laws which, which um, well, actually a lot of topics and laws which are dealt with by Donovan's Law. And I, I give you a few examples here. Um, enhanced uh, investment ecosystem, um, employment law, capital investment laws, the negative investment list, uh, just mentioned, business licensing systems, uh, numerous tax laws, construction law, education law, uh, it's not all mentioned on the slide. Uh, trade and transportation laws, environmental laws, uh, land procurement, uh, special economic zones. So maybe the better question is, what topic or law is not uh, dealt with by the omnibus law? So now that it has been passed into law um, by the, the, the government and the parliament and the, the, the president signed it uh, on 2 November 2020, um, it is being implemented by the issuance of many uh, government regulations. Uh, so, oh, yes. So, I just mentioned um, the omnibus law is, is a massive law, but the, 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 the key um, uh, regulations and uh, which is implementing the law in practice, so all the, the details uh, investors want to know, the, the, the list which business sectors are open, which are closed, what exactly are the incentives, the tax incentives or the non-tax incentives, that is all not in the law. That is in the implementing, implementing regulations, which are now being issued. Um, so the Omnibus Law uh, provides for a total of 54 implementing regulations. Uh, it's 49 government regulations and five presidential regulations. Um, 49 regulations uh, have actually already been formally issued, uh, promulgated, as we call it, uh, in February of this year and it came into effect on March 4, so uh, a bit earlier this month, so that's very recently. So the overview, so some of the, the key changes I will discuss is of course uh, the positive investment list, uh, well and, and this is just uh, it recaps the agenda, business licensing process, reduced minimum capital requirements and manpower. Um, So first I want to discuss about um, the positive investment uh, list. Um, as did the previous negative investment list, 
which, which was used for the last uh, 20 years or so, the positive event investment list uh, governs which business fields in Indonesia are fully open or fully or partly restricted for foreign investors. Um, the positive investment list, however, um, marks a fundamental change in approach from a negative restricted stance in the negative list to a positive permitted stance. Um, the positive list works basically with various definitions of open business fields. So, so these are the, the business sectors which are open for foreign direct investment, uh, which are divided in, in a, a few categories, as you can see here. So we have the open priority business fields, uh, and we'll talk about that later, uh, a little bit, 200, 246. Uh, open uh, sectors with additional restrictions. So those are the ones uh, where you still have, uh, uh, for instance, ownership restrictions, caps, or uh, medium capital requirements. And open to foreign investment in, in partnership with cooperatives and uh, small or medium enterprises. So those are open to foreign investment, but you need to find a local partner, basically. Um, and then there's the rest, open for all without restrictions. So whatever is not mentioned on the list is deemed to be open. So when you quick, quickly compare some of the uh, information between the old and the new list, uh, you see immediately that, that where 350 business fields sectors uh, were restricted for FDI in the previous list, in the new list, it's only 46 business fields are restricted. So that it's, 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 it's a dramatic change to say at least it's, I did a calculation, it's, uh, it's 85% improvement of, of, uh, of going from the 350 restricted ones to the 46 restricted ones. Um, and in addition to that, uh, 246 business uh, fields uh, have been dedicated as so-called uh, priority uh, business fields. So that means those business uh, fields sectors are described in the new investment list, in the positive investment list, it's, it's mentioned on one of the annexes, uh, and those are, are being open for, for foreign investment. Um, and it's, it's, it's not for nothing called priority business fields. Those uh, companies active in those sectors uh, are eligible for fiscal for, for, and non-fiscal incentives. Um, so this gives you a good sense of, of what the changes are of the new list. And uh, in, a, in, 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 a, in a later slide, I will go deeper into, because I already hear you, hear you thinking, what, what are these uh, sectors which are now open or more open to for investment? That, that's what I really want to know, of course. Um, let's go to the next slide. Yes. Um, so, as I just already mentioned, the, the, there are now um, priority business fields introduced uh, and the, the companies uh, or the activities should be uh, about national strategic projects. It, it has to be labor intensive. Uh, it, it needs to be high technology, pioneer industries, uh, capital intensive, it, it, and also research and, um, uh, yeah, research and development orientated. So usually these are, are, are the, the, the bigger companies. Could also be tech startups, for instance. Um, and those uh, priority business fields, uh, as, as mentioned, as are eligible for tax incentives and non-tax incentives. Um, tax incentives uh, include tax holidays, tax allowances, uh, investment allowance, uh, for instance, uh, customs allowance when, when you export import, and non-tax um, incentives uh, can be uh, ease of licensing, so that means most likely even more ease of licensing as is done in, 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 in the entire omnibus law, because that, all, that, that is also applicable for, for, for basically every company uh, who needs a license. Infrastructure facilities, um, raw material supply, ease of immigration, so that, that's mainly focused, for instance, or expatriates for which the rules are relaxed, uh, and, and also labor and other facilities. Um, the regulation on, on what, what exactly are the tax incentives, what is the scope, etc. Uh, that regulation has not yet been issued, so we are still waiting on that on that one. Yeah, so that's 
so so this is a very interesting one as i just um, already mentioned uh, i will now discuss examples of changes in the business fields which are now open for investments and um, i will go quickly uh, through them so these are the sectors um, which has uh, so, so the positive investment list made change to to these sectors and uh, in terms of ownership restrictions and then also minimum capital requirements so for distribution companies now allows 100 percent for the ownership whereas previously it was 67 percent uh, advertising also 100 percent uh, previously there were some limitations uh, that could only be asian investors uh, as in acn now for, for instance e-commerce uh, it, it also allows 100 percent foreign ownership uh, and there's and i will come back to it later a big change here because e-commerce uh, had had a, a previous requirement uh, for a minimum capital investment of 100 billion rupiah which is uh, i think 6 million us dollars when you want to have it 100 percent owned owned so for e-commerce companies who, who, who want to invest in Asia, that is now abolished. Only the, the minimum capital requirement of 10 billion uh, still applies. I will uh, talk about it later as well. For construction companies, this also uh, allows 100% for the ownership, whereas previously 67%. Uh, for construction, there are some, um, some other restrictions and details, but that's, that's too detailed to discuss it here. But the main rule is that it can be 100% uh, for an ounce. Retail companies now also 100% for an for an ounce. As you can see, there were also restrictions, 67%, uh, uh, and that depended a bit on on the uh, the size of the of the uh, store. Basically, hospitality can now also be 100% owned for two star hotels and above. As you can see, also restricted earlier to, uh, to maximum of 67% foreign owned. Plantation agriculture, uh, plantation also 100% foreign owned. Producers of vegetables, fruits, and seeds, now also 100% uh, foreign owned. Um, and medical, uh, I, I do need to say this carefully because uh, it, for medical, it, it is still pretty limited because it, it does not mean uh, like a regular clinic or a regular hospital or a regular practitioner that is still uh, closed but for clinics providing uh, dental nursing and rehabilitation services those are now 100 open but the usual general uh, um, medical hospitals are still closed but I think this will give you a good sense of, of the changes in, in all of these sectors uh, to the positive side, and, and it is materially, I would say. Yeah, so this slide is all about um, the business licensing process. Uh, one of the main uh, ob objectives of, of, the, of this part of the law is, is to ease the process to obtain a business license. Um, so, any business in Indonesia uh, used to require one or more licenses to operate, and, and, and many of these need to be extended after a certain period of time. Um, the responsibility of issuing business licensing in Indonesia is, is spread across the country and is spread across government institutions uh, on a national level and on a regional level, uh, and even on a municipality level. So this multi-layered system uh, involving various um, uh, local, regional, central agencies made it very difficult and, 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 and still makes it difficult because the new law is new, so everybody needs to use it, needs to get used to it. But for an investor uh, to know what business permits and licenses must be obtained, where to obtain them, and in what order they should apply for, that, that was always uh, a big irritation for foreign investors, uh, as, as, as also uh, slightly uh, mentioned by Miguel earlier on, on, on this, the, the gray area. Sometimes you just don't know what you need and this person says this and the other person says that. So to, to, to solve this, the, the Omnibus Law um, uh, needs to centralize the, the process and, and gives the PKPM so as I mentioned, that's the, the, the National Coordination Board uh, for Investors uh, of Indonesia to give a more central role and to, to have it in one hand instead of uh, all of these layers. 
So one, one of the, the, the things that is changed uh, also in this business licensing process is it goes to a, a risk-based method. Um, so this means that businesses, uh, business activities, business sectors uh, are divided into um, three main categories, low, medium and risk uh, category. And the, and the medium uh, risk category is divided in two sub-classifications, medium uh, low and medium high risk. So basically it, it, it means um, for low risk companies and medium low risk companies that you don't need a business license anymore. You, you only need uh, uh, the so-called NIB number, that's the, the, the business registration number. That is, that is the, the equivalent of, of, of uh, a number you get when you register your company at the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, and in Indonesia, it, it, it all goes, it, it is registered to the BKPM. But that is not a, that does not require approval, it's just a registration number you get. For medium, uh, high and, and high uh, risk uh, business, uh, businesses, uh, you, you still need to obtain um, a, a business uh, license. Uh, and also um, environmental permits and, and environmental permits. So in, in general, uh, and it's, it can be very detailed and it is not yet, um, uh, it's, it, it's not yet in detail known exactly what are the classifications or which businesses are high and low and medium. We, we are still waiting on that uh, as well. But as a summary, uh, because of this risk-based licensing system, uh, Business licensing in the low to medium categories would be much freer from regulatory hindrance. So, in, in general, um, a, a lot more businesses do not need a business license anymore at all. So, just uh, just mentioned uh, the minimum capital requirements. So, so in general, uh, in Indonesia, every for an investor who, who, who wants to incorporate a company, uh, still must have at least uh, 10 billion minimum investment. That's the minimum capital requirement. Um, and only 25% need to be paid up at, the, in, at incorporation. There are some ex uh, exceptions to that. Um, for instance, for an investment in special economic zones can have less than the 10 billion investment, EDR 10 billion investments. Uh, and, all, and specifically mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in the new positive list are tech-based startups. They want to um, provide incentives to, to tech, tech startups as well. Uh, and uh, specifically if, this, if, the, if those startups um, uh, will go uh, into the special economic zones, so, so if, if, if the company is, is located there, uh, they can uh, have not only uh, a reduced 10 billion uh, minimum capital requirement, but of course, as I mentioned earlier, they also have the uh, ability to apply for the tax and non-tax incentives. And as I just mentioned, um, for some business fields, and e-commerce is the most important one, the 100 billion investment is, is abolished because 100 billion, uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's between six and seven million USD, and that in fact was just um, for many companies, uh, the same as, as, as a restriction to, to, to incorporate this in Indonesia because uh, the, the, the height of the amount is, is, is not for everybody, for every company available. Um, so going to, the, to my last slide, uh, labor law. Uh, it's, it's always a sensitive topic in any country but in, and certainly in Indonesia. So a lot has been done and said. Um, but these are the uh, changes, uh, and I will highlight a few of the, uh, the key changes very quickly, looking at the time. So, um, for instance, fixed term contracts extension, uh, which used to be three years. So if you have a fixed contract for one year, you can uh, extend it for another one year, and then for another one year under the old rules, but then it automatically turned into a contract for an indefinite period of time. That's actually um, a pretty common rule, but that has been uh, extended to five years. So an employer can now um, extend a one-year contract or a two-year contract uh, up to five years before it automatically turns into an indefinite contract. So that's 
that's from the employer perspective, uh, more beneficial, uh, more flexible, so to say. Uh, on outsourcing, so the rules on the types of work and jobs that may be outsourced are relaxed. Uh, so under the previous rules, um, outsourcing could only be uh, where it was not the key, the core business. Uh, that could not be outsourced. But under the new rules, also uh, work which falls under the key activities of, of a company can be outsourced. Of course, it's very high over. There are all kinds of uh, uh, details and, and whatnot. But in, in general, that, that's, that's the, the flexibilization on outsourcing. Overtime is extended from three hours per day and 14 hours per week to four hours per day and 18 hours respectively. So making it also more flexible for employers to, uh, uh, to, to have the employees uh, uh, work more uh, hours um, as they see fit. Termination of employment. Um, the new uh, labor law has uh, additional grounds for termination and have a reduced severance pay. Uh, and the severance pay is, is always, uh, of course, of interest of, of everybody. Um, but uh, the, the, the new rules of severance pay are now more in line with the regional uh, Asian countries because that was uh, always um, what people looked at, uh, that Indonesia was uh, not really competitive when you look to other countries, for instance, like Thailand, that has become more competitive. So I, I just, just to get a sense of, of the changes uh, for severance pay, I. I hope you can see it. Um, I made an example here. So if you have a 10 year employee, for instance, uh, and I, I mentioned here a couple of reasons for termination, misconduct, uh, efficiency. So if, if you need to re reorganize, reorganize or force majeure under the previous rules, when you work 10 years at a company, you can get uh, 11 months salary for misconduct and 22 months for efficiency or force majeure. Under, under the so that's that's almost two years uh, pay in, in, in those uh, uh, reasons for termination. Now under the new law, uh, it has become four and a half months for misconduct, uh, which to me seems logical because after all you, you are talking about reason of termination for being misconduct, and uh, for efficiency and force majeure nine months and seven months respectively. So it's it's more or less a fifty percent. Uh, reduction of severance pay here. So this is just to, to give you a high offer sense of, of, of the changes here and um, what, is, uh, what is new. Um, so I, now I have come to the end of my, uh, of, of, of our slides here and I would like to hand over to Talia. Again, Talia, I will stop sharing now. All right, great. Thank you so much for, for that comprehensive overview of the Omnibus Law. Okay. Um, next, we'll hear from Luca Bernardinetti on Thailand. Thank you, Talia. We'll just share the, uh, my screen. Um, could you please make me a host? Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much, Talia, for the introduction. A big thank you to uh, our partners at Vistra, uh, both Miguel and, uh, and Flores for the valuable insights into Indonesia's business and investment environment. My name is Luca Bernardinetti, I'm Chairman and Managing Partner at NPG, and today we'll be speaking about investing and conducting business in Thailand. Uh, my presentation will cover some legislative and tax updates with initiatives taken by the Thai government to attract FDI into Thailand. Let me start by briefly uh, introducing the Mahana Partners Group, or MPG in short. Uh, it is a professional services firm with headquarters in Thailand. We have an ASEAN presence and a global footprint. Uh, we have been established in Thailand for 22 years, and we are intimately familiar with the business and regulatory frameworks of Thailand um, and all the other markets that we serve. We assist companies exploit inbound and outbound investment opportunities. And we're one of the most recommended law firms in Thailand by many embassies and chambers of commerce. And uh, 
here is how we can help you. We are first and foremost a law firm and we provide a rather large range of legal services uh, as we employ lawyers with diverse experience from generalists to specialists. We have a large corporate services practice assisting both SMEs and MEs with their business in Southeast Asia. And we also employ tax attorneys, accountants, and auditors, providing a wide range of accounting and tax advisory services, including tax planning and chance surprising for companies that have a presence in several countries, for example, Indonesia and Thailand. Uh, we also provide management consulting services, including capital projects management, and we assist companies with their finance requirements, whether for inbound or outbound investment. And we also assist with uh, employment, visas, and work permit. Um, as you can see, we have a worldwide presence, whether with our own offices or partner offices, we cover Asia Pacific, Europe, and North America. Um, these are some of our um, accolades, qualifications, licenses. Uh, we're members of several chambers of commerce. Uh, I personally am a member of the Banking Commission of the International Chamber of Commerce. And we represent clients in all of the countries in the world where there is a seat of arbitration of the International Chamber of Commerce. As of today, over 160 countries. Um, this is uh, today's uh, agenda. So um, what I will cover is facts and figures about doing business in Thailand, free trade agreements, specifically the recently inked RCEP, Thailand and Indonesia, both uh, signatories. Uh, relevant regulations about types of business structures, investment promotion incentives, such as those granted by the BOI, EEC, industrial estates, and special economic zones. And we will delve into what companies need to know to run a business in Thailand successfully, and we'll conclude with uh, business solutions that MPG provides. Uh, okay, so first of all, why choose Thailand? Thailand is a gateway to Asia, and it's strategically located in the heart of the Mekong region with proximity to both China and India, uh, with lots of opportunities for cross-border trade and investment in Asia and in the Southwest Pacific. Um, it has an open economy and government policy that is favorable to investment and free trade. There are generous incentives offered to foreign investors. And due to its participation in many bilateral free trade agreements, uh, in addition to the ASEAN free trade area, businesses in Thailand can engage in virtually tariff-free trade. Now, the, the Thai government also offers incentives of foreign businesses uh, operating in target industries and special zones, uh, which allow businesses to take advantage of growing border trade and investment. Thailand, Thailand itself has lots of opportunities. It's a country of nearly 70 million people with a steady growth, strong exports in a vibrant domestic consumer market. There's a wealth of natural resources, as well as skilled and cost-effective labor market. Finally, Thailand is also known for its ease of doing business. Um, my colleagues at Vistra mentioned the World, Bank's, uh, the World Bank Group's uh, 2020 Doing Business Report, and Thailand ranked 21st uh, out of 190 countries globally. Um, I mentioned the free trade agreement that Thailand is participant in and uh, Thailand is one of the 15 countries including Indonesia that have entered the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement or RCEP. Uh, so this is an agreement to broaden and deepen ASEAN's engagement with Australia, China, Japan, Korea, South Korea of course and New Zealand. Uh, together these RCEP signatory countries account for about 30% of the global GDP and 30% of the world's population. So the purpose of this agreement is to establish a modern, comprehensive, high quality and mutually beneficial economic partnership to facilitate the expansion of regional trade and investment and contribute to global economic growth and development. The RCEP agreement supports an open, inclusive and rules-based multilateral trading system. You can see a few of the benefits on the slides. The key points of the RCEP are the trading goods and trading services, rules of origin, customs procedures, and trade facilitation, among others. Okay, um, I will start by um, speaking about company incorporation in Thailand, which is one of the factors 
that the World Bank and other indexes um, consider while assessing the ease of doing business and competitiveness of a country. So company corporation is one of our primary corporate services. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into much detail, but anyone interested in learning more can contact us personally for a longer explanation. So the most common type of business entity for foreigners to incorporate in Thailand is a Thai limited company. The registration process for this type of business is very straightforward and the type of activities it can engage in is very broad. On this slide, you'll see some of the required steps for setting up a Thai limited liability company, which include reserving a company name, opening a bank account, and transferring the required paid up capital, completing and submitting the memorandum of association to the Department of Business Development, which is a department of the Ministry of Commerce, and registering for VAT and Social Security. We say that on average, uh, provided that all the documents are presented uh, in order, the process takes about two weeks to complete. And finally, as you can see on this slide, one important requirement uh, is that at least 51% of a Thai company's shares must be held by Thai nationals. These are some of other details which are necessary for the company corporation, uh, such as the company's registered address, which must be proved with a regular lease agreement, the contact details, location map, company's paid up capital with indication of the par value per share, and last but not least, the company's objective. And this is very a very important point because um, the activities that foreign-owned companies um, can carry out in Thailand are limited by the Foreign Business Act, as we will see in a few slides. Um, this slide summarizes the laws, the rules, and regulations for doing business in Thailand. So after you have successfully incorporated a company, uh, you still have to tackle a few legal hurdles and ensure compliance with regulations. So the amount of minimum registered capital required depends on the type of company. For foreign businesses, the minimum capital required will be 2 million Thai baht or 3 million, uh, depending on the type of business, but it would ultimately depend on the scope of the business. For example, um, for tech companies, there are generally no minimum capital requirements, uh, but uh, we always recommend having a paid up capital of at least 2 million baht or around uh, $60,000, million, uh, $60, apologies. And this is to ensure a smooth market entry because com anyways, company will need this uh, paid up capital for their CAPEX. Uh, another issue is foreign workers and work permits. So a Thai company hiring a foreigner must have applied for a tax ID and VAT registration and have a minimum paid up capital of at least 2 million baht per foreign employee. Also, Thai company must have a ratio of at least four Thai employees for every foreign workers one year visa. And uh, on the other side of the slide, you'll see that there are some general accounting issues, compliance with reporting standards for financial statements, taxes and social security contributions, which generally uh, need to be filed multiple times a year. And every Thai company must employ a corporate secretary. And these are all services that MPG provides to companies after they are incorporated. Now let's look at uh, types of businesses in Thailand. Um, the foreign business license is what I briefly mentioned earlier. So the Thai law regulates the activities that uh, majority foreign owned companies are allowed to engage in under the Foreign Business Act also known as FBA. So the FBA sets out the uh, uh, rights and limitations on foreign doing business in Thailand. And by foreigner, we uh, would designate a person that is not of Thai nationality or a company that is not registered in Thailand or even a company registered in Thailand in which foreigners hold at least 50% of shares outstanding. So under the FBA, some businesses business activities are completely prohibited to foreigners. Um, some might be engaged in with prior approval from a government agencies, and some do not require any special approval at all. So to engage in activities where Thai companies are not be, uh, yet ready to compete with foreigners, such as legal services or accounting, the foreign company must obtain a foreign business license before it begins operations. Uh, the main benefit of a foreign business license is that foreigners can own up to 100% of a company. Um, we will 
talk about a different type of company structures, which also allows uh, foreigners to own 100% of share of standing, which is the BOI type of company. Um, BOI stands for Board of Investment, which is a Thai government agency established in order to attract foreign direct investment in Thailand by offering incentives to companies which meet certain criteria. So the greatest benefits of a BOI company are tax exemptions and reductions, the ability to own land and the right for foreign investors to own 100% of a company's shares outstanding. BOI incentives, as you see in this slide, can be divided into two types, tax and non-tax incentives. Tax incentives consist of several exemptions and reductions in taxes for certain amounts of time, depending also on the applicant's business activities. So most importantly, um, let's mention a corporate income tax exemption, a total exemption for up to eight years. And the non-tax incentives consist of privileges that are not normally given to foreign investors. So BOI companies can operate under full foreign ownership, as I mentioned earlier, and are the only type of foreign company that is also able to own land in Thailand. On these slides, you can see eligible activities for BI promotion. So in order to qualify for BY promotion, a company must engage in at least one of those eligible business activities. Um, these include the following eight business categories displayed on the slide, such as light industry, mining, uh, ceram uh, ceramic, uh, chemicals, papers and plastic, and so on and so forth. And those are the criteria for granting investment incentives. So not all companies may be entitled to uh, be registered as BOI. Most, uh, most companies invested in Thailand would register a Thai limited company. Um, the criteria are very stringent and the BOI offers several types of incentives also depending on whether companies may qualify for activity-based incentives or merit-based incentives. So activity-based incentives are granted to certain activities, knowledge-based or which use high technology such as um, we have a few nanotech, biotech, digital in the slide. Um, they uh, enhance Thailand's research and development and capacities and overall competitiveness. Um, the amount and type of tax incentives granted to a business will depend on how the BOI classifies their activities. For instance, businesses in Group A1 uh, will receive the most generous in tax incentives, which would, such as the aforementioned eight-year uh, corporate income tax exemption with no cap, an exemption for input duty for machinery and raw materials for at least one year, and the previously mentioned non-tax incentives. Also, in 2017, the BOI introduced technology-based incentives to promote Thailand's technological competitiveness. So core technologies, including biotechnology and nanotechnology and supporting services such as research and development are eligible for a 10-year corporate income tax exemption with also the possibility of additional incentives for up to three more years. And then merit-based incentives, which are an additional category of incentives granted to projects which enhance uh, Thailand's competitiveness, contribute to the de decentralization. Let's consider Bangkok as the um, investment hub for Thailand, but the government is trying to decentralize um, investment to other remote areas of Thailand or promote development of industrial zones. Uh, so like, just like activity-based incentives, the amount and type of the tax incentives granted uh, for merit-based incentives depends on how the BOI categorizes the project's business activities and merits. Um, so this is a case study. So one of the BOI's main goals is to promote investment that enhances Thailand's competitiveness by encouraging research and development and innovation. Uh, in our case study, this made-up company, Singatronics, I hope the name, the company doesn't exist. It's just a case study, it's a made-up name. Um, so this is an SME in Singapore that produces electronics and electronic appliances and has a proprietary design for its own products. So the SME sees potential in internationalizing into Thailand to exploit the market gap. So they set up a BOI company in Thailand, which allows them to retain full foreign ownership of the Thai company and enjoy several tax and non-tax incentives. 
In this case, the SME has a proprietary design. It's very important that it's proprietary. Um, so it falls within section, as you see, 5.111 of the BOI Act, and therefore it will enjoy an eight-year corporate income tax exemption with a cap, as well as exemption from machinery import duty, if applicable, and also an exemption from import duty on raw materials and all of the BOI non-tax incentives. So if this company, Singatronics, did not have an, the, its own design process for the product, which, which is why I mentioned the, I highlighted the word proprietary design. In, in, that, uh, in that other case, it would have been classified as an A3 activity as opposed to an A2 activity and would therefore receive a five-year income tax exemption as opposed to an eight-year. So, Singatronics must satisfy at least one of the following conditions to qualify for BY privileges. Um, first, the electrical products must be able to connect to the Internet of Things, the uh, so-called IoT, or the electrical products must, ha must have circuits or operation control systems, processing systems, uh, or embedded systems of software that allow for more complex uh, or a variety of function. So this is all for the BOI. Uh, any questions will be addressed in the Q&A session. Let me just delve into the industrial estates in Thailand, which I mentioned earlier as a, um, areas uh, that are also uh, aiming at decentralizing investment. So industrial estates are regulated by the Industrial Estate Authority uh, of Thailand, the so-called IEAT. Uh, there are also industrial parks and industrial zones that are uh, privately owned and operated. So rather than building from scratch, most businesses prefer to secure sites in industrial estates, uh, which are pre-built factories, warehouses, and other necessary infrastructure, uh, in addition to utilities and transport links. So companies in industrial estates may also receive tax release and investment support. Uh, industrial estates uh, offer tax and non-tax privileges to industrial operators um, depending on the type of zone the investment is located in and in, in general industrial zone for example uh, industrial operators have the right to own land in an industrial estate visa and work permit facilitation for foreign skilled workers and also their spouses and dependents and the right to send money abroad um, additionally, with the right to receive additional privileges from the BOI. So the two types of privileges can be combined. In addition to known tax privileges, industrial operators located in export processing zone um, do not have to pay import duties on imported raw materials. And they also do not have to pay export duty when exporting the finished products. And furthermore, under the BOI's merit-based incentive scheme, if projects are located within industrial estates or promoted industrial estates, um, those projects may, may be granted one additional year of corporate income tax exemption. Again, this can be combined with the BOI. Um, however, if one of the conditions um, for an activity to be promoted under the BOI is for the projects to be located within industrial states or promoted industrial zones, these additional incentives will not apply. Um, special economic zones. So special economic zones or special economic development zones are located in 10 provinces around Thailand in border regions. Um, so these areas provide for incentives uh, for targeted industrial activities, although not every uh, SCZ promotes the same activity. So um, like other investment schemes, the government offers both tax and non-tax incentives. Tax incentives for those investing in SCZs include a corporate income tax exemption for up to eight years, plus a 50% tax reduction for up another five years. In addition, businesses will enjoy double deductions for transportation, water, and electricity utility costs up to 25% deduction for utility construction costs, input duty exemption for machinery and raw materials used for export, and also permission to own land. Um, additionally, there is also permission to use non-skilled labor and employment of foreign experts. So employment of experts uh, for limited companies, we, we spoke about the um, criteria and the limitations. Those limitations do not apply if the company is based in one of the 
uh, special economic development zones. Um, if you're not in Thailand, you may have heard of the uh, Eastern Economic Corridor or EEC, which has been very um, say advertised even out of Thailand. So um, the, the Thai government has also established the uh, so-called EEC um, as a special uh, economic zone that is developed in three eastern provinces in Thailand, encouraging investment um, in a number of industries which use uh, innovation high technology. So the design zones for targeted industries uh, are the following, as you can see on the slide. Eastern Economic Corridor of Innovation, uh, that is an innovation district that supports research and development projects, uh, which brings together uh, the public sector and academia. Also, Digital Park Thailand, which is a new cluster with a specific focus on digital innovation and investment, and the so-called Eastern Airport City, which is an airport center development area uh, incorporating a redeveloped Utapao Airport and other aviation facilities, which also aims to improve uh, connectivity by air. You may have read about the um, very big um, uh, railway project connecting three major airports, which are Savannapum, uh, Domwang, and Utapao. Uh, in addition, there are designated zones uh, they also include 21 industrial states, uh, which were designated by the EEC Policy Committee as promoted zones for targeted industries, and 19 other BOI promoted industrial states uh, or zones in the three provinces. And uh, all investors in EEC zones are entitled to exemption from corporate income tax for up to 13 years possibly pair with the subsequent 50% reductions. Uh, although the length of time they're granted the tax privileges for uh, will vary depending on the business activities and the zone of the, in which the investment is located in. Um, projects located in the first three zones I mentioned receive the most generous incentives and to be eligible for EEC promotions, um, the business must operate in one of the 10 targeted industries. So you can see um, those industries in the slide, automotive, smart electronics, agriculture and biotechnology, food processing and tourism, and next generation industries such as uh, automation and robotics, aviation and logistics, biofuel and biochemicals, digital and medical and healthcare. So the government is currently focusing on targeting the first five industries for further development as well as uh, the second five, which is um, which are less developed industries within Thailand. So the emphasis of the EEC is on technology and improving uh, the area's connectivity uh, as seen with the current projects further um, to further develop it. the aforementioned Utapao Airport, the um, Len Chang Port and High Speed Railway. Okay, so that's all for me. I'll uh, um, let Talia delve into uh, some of the most recent tax and legal updates for Thailand, also uh, with the aim of attracting FDI. Thailand, over to you. All right, great. Thank you, Luca. So I'm just going to give a very brief summary um, of several draft regulations that should use doing business in Thailand in the future. Um, and then we'll go into the Q&A section of this webinar. So in 2020, the Thai cabinet approved two sets of draft amendments to the Civil and Commercial Code in Thailand. And these amendments would be another step towards streamlining business, um, business regulations in Thailand. So I'll go over a few of the more impactful changes very quickly. Um, one of the changes will be a reduction in the number of promoters required to establish a company in Thailand, um, a private limited company in Thailand. Um, so currently you have to have three promoters um, to incorporate a company. This amendment, if passed, would reduce that to only two. Um, and then as a result of that, the minimum number of shareholders that a company must maintain at all time would also drop to only two. Um, and, the num and this would also impact the minimum number of shareholders required to establish quorum. Um, so this would expedite the process of company formation and it should also protect shareholders' interests 
um, since companies would no longer need to search for a third dummy shareholder uh, for compliance purposes. So a second change proposed by the amendments um, would be wholly electronic meetings of shareholders and directors. Um, and this came about temporarily last year as a result of COVID, uh, but the draft amendments would formalize this change. Um, so previous regulations on e-meetings still required attendees to be present in Thailand, um, and at least a third um, of quorum had to be physically present in the meeting. So this will be a really welcome change that will improve convenience for many companies. So um, another huge change that the amendments will, will should um, enact um, would be the introduction of a merger into Thai law. Um, so in a merger, a company absorbs um, another existing corporate entity. Um, and previously, Thai law only recognized the concept of amalgamation um, and acquisition. So in a merger, or sorry, amalgamation, um, a completely new company will be formed through the integration of two or more entities. Um, which will thereupon cease to exist. And so the audit option um, of a merger would provide flexibility to companies that wish to take over another company's assets, um, human resources, and market. So um, another regulation that's still in its draft form but um, is looking to come through the pipeline is the One Person Company Act. Um, as Luca discussed earlier, in order to incorporate a private limited company in Thailand, you need a minimum of three promoters. Um, however, this might change in the future, since in 2018, a draft bill uh, for the establishment of a private limited company by an individual person uh, was approved by the Thai Cabinet and Council of State. And under this new regime, a single shareholder would be able to form the company, um, act as its sole capital contributor and manager. Um, thereby greatly simplifying the process of company incorporation. Um, so as a result, burdensome requirements like annual shareholders meetings and board of directors meetings would not apply to this type of company. Um, this type of company uh, would be very attractive to small businesses and startups. Um, unfortunately, it seems unlikely that it would be available to foreigners. Um, however, since most types of business in Thailand are restricted to majority Thai-owned companies anyways, um, foreign entities and individuals looking to do business in Thailand would need to set up um, a typical three-person limited company uh, with 51% Thai ownership anyways. So in this last section, before we do the q and I'll just briefly go over some of the services MPG offers um, that will help your company um, succeed in Thailand. So like many other companies um, who experienced a disruption as a result of COVID, um, we adopted a number of teleworking strategies, um, such as cloud-based accounting, um, which provides a lot more flexibility and convenience to clients. Um, and once you set up a business in Thailand, um, you'll need to ensure constant compliance with regulations and requirements. Um, on this slide, you'll see a few of the areas where NPG continues to help businesses after incorporation. Um, including our legal, accounting, auditing, tax advisory, and business consulting services. Um, we offer an end-to-end -end service model, so virtually any problem a company will face during um, its incorporation and after, uh, we're ready to help with. All right, we also offer transfer pricing services. This will be helpful to companies involved in international trade um, or those with entities located outside of Thailand. And we also offer financial due diligence service services as well as other legal offerings. All right, so that concludes our presentation. Um, please feel free to contact us, um, info at mahanacornpartners.com. If you have any questions about what we covered today, um, follow us at LinkedIn or Facebook. All right, and now we're going to proceed to the Q&A section. So speakers, um, would you open up your cameras? Right. Um, and then feel free to type any questions you might have into the Q&A box, um, which can be opened by clicking on the icon at the bottom of the screen. All right, so we had one question from earlier um, from Cedric, um, and he asked about PPP and infrastructure um, and 100% foreign ownership. So Flores, um, would you be willing to talk about that? Yes, uh, thank you, Italia. Um, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, 
So for in infrastructure projects, uh, investments uh, in Indonesia, the government uh, first asked to have an entity, a legal entity in Indonesia. Uh, and basically the ownership percentage uh, of that entity depends on the project. Um, it's also good to know that, that for infrastructure projects, uh, the government has, has the ultimate authority to overrule some of the regulations uh, for strategic purposes. However, uh, as we have seen, I, I discussed that in the positive investment list, um, it's basically the entire sector is open for 100% now. Um, but the infrastructure sector is, uh, it is not as, as, as easy as it uh, might seem. So there are some catches. Uh, so I would say to, um, to the one who posed the question, uh, to contact us and we can uh, provide uh, more details uh, on, on the specific project or infrastructure um, company. Um, because it, as I said, it, it, it depends on, on, on that as well. Uh, yeah, I can perhaps offer some insights about the same question in Thailand. Um, so in Thailand, it is uh, possible for foreign companies to participate in bidding for PPP projects. Uh, by, PPP, by PPP, we talk about private, uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, because not everyone may know that. So there are projects where the private sector and the public sector work together, uh, sharing the risk for the project. And normally, the private sector owns the project for them. Uh, operating, maintaining the, an infrastructure, um, an asset to be then transferred to the public sector. So, as I was mentioning, uh, it is very unlikely that uh, uh, foreigners might be entitled to 100% ownership, even if um, international bidding is something that can be done. There is, a, uh, however, a caveat. Uh, foreign companies may participate and may bid for uh, infrastructure projects in Thailand, provided they do so by registering a local Thai subsidiary, uh, which de facto would turn the international bidding, uh, uh, let's say, uh, act into a uh, domestic bidding uh, process. Um, and also for uh, equity investment, uh, when there's consortiums with uh, uh, local companies, the, in most of the cases, the Thai companies own the majority of the, the, the shares of the consortium, which is um, then substantiated with a, an SPV or special purpose vehicle for the project. So um, the short answer is uh, no, uh, foreigners must uh, uh, have a local entity and uh, only uh, 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 Thai-led consortia may uh, on assets in Thailand. Thank you, Flores and Luca. Um, so we have another question. Um, this one's also going to Distra. Um, to what extent do you think the omnibus law makes Indonesia more competitive um, when compared to other regional countries? Thank you, Talia. Um, so basically one of the main aims of the omnibus law is to make uh, in Indonesia more competitive with other countries, uh, specifically the, the regional countries in Asia. Um, the, the thought behind it is, 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 is of course general, but also when you make it more competitive, you attract more uh, foreign investors. Uh, so for instance, take the new labor, labor law rules, uh, the, the increase of doing business, um, the materially reduced regulatory and tape environment. So it is it expected that, that in the next few years, Indonesia will become a lot more competitive as a result of the Omnibus Law. And of course, it has just been enacted and it takes time to, um, for the regulations to have effect in practice. Uh, many institutions need to change their uh, systems, etc. Uh, but it's expected that in the next few years, you can see uh, already results in this. Thank you. All right, great, thank you. Um, okay, and then we have a question for Luca as well. Um, so what are some important considerations for companies um, who are looking to enter the Thai market um, during COVID? All right, so um, 
as statistics show, COVID has hit Thailand uh, mostly economically rather than uh, uh, from a health standpoint. So there are very few cases. Uh, most offices, most businesses have uh, uh, kept the doors open last year. Uh, we resumed working from the office full time since June last year. Uh, and even if there was a second spike of COVID cases in uh, uh, towards New Year's Eve, it was uh, swiftly dealt with and now the situation is again under control. So I would say from a um, healthcare standpoint, the um, advice I would give to new entrants in this market is to observe the, um, the law and uh, to, uh, to avoid being in a very crowded areas, uh, which again is not uh, uh, it's something that is uh, advised against by the government, but there is no uh, effective um, law that prevents uh, business people to from uh, doing business from the office. So um, what we managed to do last year and also we're doing now is um, digital offering digitalized approach to business incorporation and to most of the corporate services that we offer. So as a consequence of COVID, we, um, uh, we can do pretty much everything without having our um, clients in Thailand. So most of the uh, company corporations can be done by, uh, you know, remotely without uh, having uh, a company representative in Thailand. Uh, the only um, adverse effect is that if they want to come to Thailand, they have to undergo two weeks quarantine. Um, besides that, you know, running the business is pretty much, um, I would say, uh, seamless, even if uh, the COVID is uh, probably going to be with us for, for a very long time. All right, great. Thank you, Luca. Um, since we've gone quite a bit over time, um, we're going to end things up now. Um, but if you have any questions for MPG or Vistra, then please feel free to contact us. Um, we're really happy to help with any questions. Um, and we hope that you have a good week ahead. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Nadia, Luca.